Good afternoon, and welcome to the Dean's Honor Symposium panel, Resisting Hegemony Through Education. My name is Judy Pryor Ramirez, and I'm the director of the Office of Civic Engagement and Social Justice and part-time faculty member here at Lang. It is my honor and pleasure to have facilitated and worked alongside this semester with this fierce group of radical educators who will introduce themselves momentarily. But first, what is hegemony? Hegemony is the process by which dominant culture maintains its dominant position in society. Author Cecile Pineda puts it this way. I live in a world in which 40 men control equal to that of nearly 80 countries, where to maintain their hegemony, countless acts of mayhem and massacre must occur every day. This is the reality that forms and reforms my days as it does to all those people in this hapless planet. This process can take many forms, and today our panelists will engage in a conversation about, hege about hegemonic, hegemonic forces that incite violence. When you hear them speak about violence today, they may or may not be talking about physical violence and we are, as we are conditioned to understand in our society. Drawing from feminist theoretical traditions, our panelists will complicate notions of violence in our society, locate various sites of violence, and share how their projects are an intervention to resisting hegemony and its violent forces. Please join me in welcoming our radical educators. Thank you, Judy. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Salyer. Um, let me just pull up my PowerPoint here. So I have completed a project that's currently titled Interrupting a Culture of Sexual Violence Through Early Consent-Based Sexuality Education. Um, I'll show you a series of slides of illustrations from a children's book that I've written. And the children's book is in response to a series of questions that I've been investigating through my research paper around the correlation between sexual education and the different forms sex education takes across the United States and um, trends of sexual violence. And I've understood these trends of sexual violence in a larger context of a culture where this type of violence is normalized it's incredibly pervasive and common to the point where it's almost understood as being natural or inherent or something that's just unavoidable in life. So my real question was, how, how do we come to have those ideas and what types of things are we learning as children that teach us how to behave um, and live up to certain ideas of gender that might require us to act violent or to act passive and um, other things that I'll be able to get into in more detail when we do our roundtable discussion. So um, I figured I would like to write a children's book on consent. Um, and consent might interrupt these norms of sexual violence um, by endowing women and people who might be considered genderqueer with agency and the ability to say no. It also encourages um, emotional intelligence and communication in um, boys and men who are typically enc encouraged not to hold those emotional skills in communication. And then finally, um, by creating consent-based education or embedding sex and sexuality education in intimacy, communication, relationships, consent, and it's culturally and socially relevant. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting more into some of the theoretical groundings that I, was, I used to develop my project and to talk a little bit more about my book. So that's what I have for now. Hello there. Is this the one? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like it. Um, hi guys, I'm Karina Bakitova. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, my project in education is The Void Academy. My two co-founders, Santa and Noah, are right here. Um, and our mission is to help artists use technology to make a living. So um, it's a very different educational endeavor than is Kelsey's, but um, uh, we essentially started this organization uh, 
uh, because we realized that most artists generally like, generate less than a to less than a quarter of their income through their art, um, and there are more than two million people just in this country with art degrees. Yet only eight percent make a living as artists, um, and we saw this as sort of um, you know the arts economy is part of the greater economy; it's not separate. And so the violences and the oppression and the um, sort of uh, flooding hegemonic wave that exists in the sort of greater economy also exists in the arts. And our sort of entry point into trying to um, sort of help the, the greater economy was happened to be through the arts because we're all artists and that was sort of the um, part of the world which we wanted to affect, which is the art world. Um, one of the biggest issues that we see in the way that the arts operates is specifically in the way that uh, capitalism has sort of uh, co-opted art and has, has its hand very deep now in the art market and um, the philanthropic and museum and gallery efforts um, that are supposed to be there to help artists make a living and to help artists sustain their work and actually uh, be able to do this as the thing that they do with their lives um, are not so great at helping them do that sustainably. Um, so some of the more common things that we see, some of the more common issues that we see with um, the museum system um, is that, or the philanthropic system, I guess, at large, is that um, you know artists will get grants, but those are very competitive, um, and they'll get one and maybe it'll fund them for six months of their life, but it's not going to fund them through everything, um, through, yeah, and it's not going to fund them sustainably. Who knows whether they'll get a grant next time or they won't? Um, and so our sort of solution to interrupt. Um, to sort of uh, interrupt this uh, world, this art world, the system in which artists are not able to make a living, um, and in which the um, sort of uh, greater the, the issues of greater economy, which is what Bell Hooks calls the uh, white supremacist, racist, heter heteropatriarchy, um, all of the, all of those things are, are very present in the art world. And our way of doing it was to sort of come back to a world in which art is made for communities and not for uh, museums or galleries or for wealthy people um, and our solution was to create an educational platform um, that advocates artists to use alternative inter internet based business models um, which allow them to directly connect to their communities through things like crowdfunding maybe you guys have heard of Kickstarter um, make a sustainable living and maintain a, a complete ownership of their art so that's sort of the quick summary. It's, it's hard to talk through the whole thing, but in hopefully in the roundtable conversation, we can get more into the details of uh, this. So my name is Stefania Rentas, and I am the founder of Casa Experimental, an after-school arts program uh, that encourages process-based education with contemporary and experimental practices. Um, I also, as well, take influence from Bell Hooks and the practice of freedom. Uh, in, the, in the classroom, we actively dismantle the hegemonic ideologies trickled down from capitalism to the public school system. Also, just like Karina's work, uh, we understand the physical and emotional labor that performance, sound, visual arts requires and work towards a better understanding of what career in the arts can encompass. Through our gallery space, which is uh, held inside the Silent Barn, uh, is a, it's a community space in Bushwick that has um, residencies, um, other galleries, uh, recording studios, libraries. Um, the students have a physical space where they can display their work as working artists. Um, we also hold artist workshops to give students access to a network of working artists in New York who share their artistic process um, as a way of creating that's not really tied down to a textbook textbook definition. Um, we had like an artist, uh, Glendali Medina, who encouraged us to explore um, the figure behind graffiti tags and an art that is very, very present in our neighborhood. Um, CASA, uh, as a safe space for exploration, critical thinking, and open conversations, uh, works to decolonize the role of the student in a system by bringing in counter-hegemonic cultural practices. So we share a lot of like real-time histories, um, art is healing, socially engaged art, and activism is core to um, our practice. Uh, we come into the classroom willing to share our resources, lived experiences, so we can engage in conversations around identity and community, um, and intervene in the everyday violence that happens through social and cultural ideological hegemony. Um, behind me, you'll see some workshops that we've had. Um, within Julie with Food, we had a drawing workshop 
uh, where we created multiple uh, drawings that in the end we collaged together and from that process we created a new drawing. Um, and one of the highlights for me specifically uh, was working with Mi Casa No Su Casa, which is a grassroots Bushwick organization um, of Bushwick natives that um, are working against gentrification that is plaguing the neighborhood. Um, so we made illuminated, illuminated signs against gentrification. This one says derecho a derecho, which, which is a right to a roof. Um, so that is Casa Experimental. Thank you so much. So, I can't believe that we're finally here. Um, I guess the way that I want, you know, what I again heard you guys say and what I've been thinking about as you guys both presented was mm -hmm. um, this idea of space um, mm -hmm. and the fact that in what I see that ties us together besides the educational component is the fact that we are trying to resist hegemony in the ways that it enters different spaces, so whether it's the, you know, the space of a brain of a child um, mm -hmm. at a young age when they're just beginning to learn about sex and gender and uh, you know, may or may not be learning about consent, uh, whether it's the space um, inside the labor of the bodies of artists or whether it's actually the physical space um, and giving uh, kids uh, agency in trying to fight back against the intrusion. Uh, of gentrification. So I guess my question is, how do you guys see space in your projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, I'm working with a little bit of an abstract idea of what space I'm intervening in here, in a way, because in one way it is the mind of a child is the identity that we begin developing from very, very young age through our experiences and the people that are role modeling for us around us. but. Um, as I was thinking through my project, I was thinking, what are the actual tangible physical spaces where this is happening? Um, what are the day-to-day -day things that happen that start solidifying these identities? And I think something I remember really well as a child is story time with um, my parents and other caregivers that I had. And I got to do a little bit of research also about what happens during that, like lap time reading. Um, which is why I one of the reasons I chose a children's book. And I'm also an aunt for two little four-year-old and a one-year-old, so I wanted something that I could actually use um, <laughs> as I'm trying to take care of them, too. So um, it might not be lap like story time reading and lap time reading um, might not be a space we think of as something that, that might be intruded in by broader social and cultural ideas, because it's an intimate space. But that's something that I was really thinking about as, as I was writing my book, is what type of broader cultural and social ideas that might be oppressive or violent are getting into our intimate lives at a young age. Um, so interrupting that, that space to me was a little tricky to navigate, but also really important to see that intimate caregiving space as an opportunity to intervene in these larger ideas um, that seem to have nothing to do with that. Yeah. Absolutely. And also, the si I should say that the Silent Barn uh, was started by non-natives. So we're taking, um, Casa is taking these Brooklyn born and bred artists and is placing them <coughs> in this space of white domination uh, and this gallery is functioning as a space of consciousness that these that if you're going to involve yourself in the community you have to be aware of your surroundings um, as for example right now um, the exhibition which is open every day at four uh, is of a large photographic installation by artist Gemma Lopez and together we all photograph the youth center, which is where we operate out of, and place it within the walls of the silent barn where our gallery is held. Uh, so it's so it's a, it's a space where you can't really just look away, which is pretty important to me. Yeah, if I could just add quickly, I think it's space, but it's also visibility, mm -hmm. right? So. For me, making this idea of consent visible as we're learning about our identities. And I think what you do is incredibly powerful because 
Bushwick. There are certain places you can walk in Bushwick and not see a single person of color or a single person that was born and raised there. So for you to interrupt a space where people have moved here and kind of engaged in that space to a point where they pushed all the people who were there first out to then interrupt that and bring all of these beautiful artistic Brooklyn born and raised kids into that space kind of yeah exactly like you said you can't look away and forces people to address what's actually been going on and what the real dynamics of the community are now so I think it's incredibly powerful not only for the people who have moved into Bushwick but also for the kids who feel like they may have been displaced um, to kind of work through what has happened in the last five to ten years in their lives yeah yeah, and I think for me, the space, you know, starting out as a kid coming to New York and being like, okay, like where, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, there wasn't much art, you know, art there, and it was, I sort of felt starved for it, so I started coming into the city when I was like 15 on the edge of 16, and, you know, going to the MoMA, and then moving to New York and thinking, you know, coming to New School and being like, oh, like the museums and the galleries, like I'm finally here, like this is, this is where the art is, and then slowly over the course of the last couple of, couple of years realizing that, the art is in museums and in the galleries, you know, in Chelsea, not for the right reasons, and that the intention behind putting that art into those spaces is not always the best. And I don't want to be reductive and say that it's always that way, it's not. Uh, but in many cases, in many cases it is, and it's because the museum and gallery system are contributing to the c capitalistic cycle um, that is so pertinent, especially in the visual arts right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so then being like, okay, well, how, and then, you know, coming back to, like, me being a kid in New Jersey and thinking, where's the art, where's the art? And like, why isn't there more art in, in places like that? Like yeah, why yeah. do artists have to run towards these big metropolitan cities to get their work out there? Why can't artists exist everywhere mm -hmm. and create art for small, small communities? And I think that's where the Void Academy comes in is to exactly, um, is exactly for that reason, is to create that space for artists to be able to do that, to teach them mm -hmm. um, alternative business models that don't rely on grants and on um, you know, gallery support where they only make art for their community and ask their community to support it or at least, you know, su supplement it with whatever other resources that they have mm -hmm. um, so that art can start to come back to the places where it rightfully belongs, which is with their communities. Um, yeah. yeah. So space. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, something, I w a question I had when you were giving us your introduction um, was about what what is in the galleries and why, like who is being represented, and maybe you can bring in this idea of hegemony there because my understanding is that people are curating that, and so there's something specific that people who are curating the museums and galleries want to say, not only about the culture that the artist is representing, but about art itself. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, just a, just a couple of months ago, I can't remember, six or seven months ago, Guerrilla Girls, which is an activist group, uh, came out with another round of stats. I can't quite remember the stats, but it was the stats were specific, the specific numbers, but they were showing just the ratio of female artists to male artists that are represented by some of the major wealthiest galleries in, um, in just in the city, and the ratio was insane. So even just yeah. like on the simple level of just like man, man to woman, um, there is such a such a disparity. Um, so when we think about you know who the galleries are owned by and mm -hmm. who the galleries are feeding and who the who the galleries are throwing right. the art to and to mm -hmm. which auction houses and who that actually affects, um, I think you know that's definitely there. And you know the other day I was in um, I went to the new Met Brower to see this show called Unfinished, and they had all of this all of these unfinished paintings and they had like. Baroque and like 1800s and modernism and all, all these wonderful paintings. And the second uh, section of the exhibition was um, was contemporary art. And for some reason, and there was absolutely no reason for this, but they had like 15 Picassos. <laughs> like it was just like the Met trying to like show off their contemporary collection instead of showing, you know, they could have done so much. I understand that like with the modernist and the Baroque floor, you can't do much because that's the art that was, you know, yeah. that was being made. It was made mostly by men, mostly by white European men. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll let it go. But <laughs> the second floor where it's the contemporary wing, you can do anything that you want. There's so many amazing female, queer, 
uh, people of color artists that you can put on that floor. There's yeah. no need for you to show off your 15 unfinished Picassos. Yeah. So it's these types of things that just make my skin crawl out. <laughs> um, because that's you know another simple exam example of hegemony that happened yes you know two days ago on Friday. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, have, I have more questions. <laughs> yeah. um, what are your <laughs> Well, I'm also thinking about this idea of, of you both, I mean, all of us in different ways, using these different spaces as a mode of resistance. Um, and maybe we can talk to Steph about how you, how you understand what you're, you're doing as resistance to hegemony, because in your introduction, you mentioned that um, it's a way to decolonize the role of a student and a way to resist the trickle down, the hegemonic trickle down of ideology into the public school system. So maybe you could break it down a little bit, because there's a lot of uh, terms like decolonize is a really strong um, idea to invoke. So maybe you could talk about that and, and the hegemony you're referring to that's trickling into schools. and and maybe link that up with this idea of resistance? Definitely um, taking the public school system as a, some sort of training for young people to be ready for the capitalist world that we live in is really, does not bode well with my understanding of what an education should be. Yeah. So when I actually have access to a classroom, I'm going to, um, also, a lot of bell hooks that's going on in my brain come in not, um, and also Paulo Freire, not coming in as an expert, but more as in a person with information and shared experiences and lived experiences that we might not know of each other. So creating an environment, uh, an accepting environment, definitely, um, and understanding, understanding my own privilege coming into uh, the classroom and as I said before our personal histories uh, yeah um, cool yeah yeah I think I don't know it's, it's interesting that I think something that I noticed right away when we got together to start this panel is that we are affecting people at such different stages in their lives I mean like your project starts you know the, the children's book is for kids between three and five. It's it's appropriate for kids five years old and, and uh, yeah, so And you. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't caught up on consent, <laughs> she's got you. Um, but yeah, so starting you know, starting with five years old, then with you it's like high school, fourteen through seventeen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then with me it's basically like adult, like like starting with college, but also, you know, we've been talking about collaborating and mm -hmm. doing some you know, having the Void Academy do some courses for yeah. the young students. But it's so it just shows how there is a resistance is needed starting with like five years old throughout high school and then into um, when you're older and you're in college and I think that there's something um, there's something really profound around uh, the idea of community you know mm -hmm. about sort of hand holding each other and working together through these different stages in our lives as you know as kids and, and as artists and mm -hmm. as people people out and people that are living under this hegemonic, capitalistic um, mm -hmm. world. <laughs> yeah, and I think we're also talking, each of us are talking in our own way about the ways that we're exposed to violence at different points in our lives. Um, and definitely Stephanie and I talking about kids' exposure to violence with you, um, the violence of gentrification and being displaced um, and being excluded from spaces in your own neighborhood because it's for artists, as if you can't fit into that category. Um, and you know, I think what you do is applicable to any old, like older person, teens to adults um, who are trying to re re resist the violence that, might, like, let me rephrase that, that are trying to resist maybe the instability and sometimes impoverished conditions of an artist who all they want to do is create but can't sustain themselves in doing so but aren't willing to compromise on this creed they feel they have to create and represent the culture. Um, and then for me, something I've found I have a lot of resist or pushback on with when I'm talking to people about this book is I'm talking about consent to a five-year-old, which means I have to acknowledge the existence of non-consensual activity 
and violence that kids might be experiencing. Um, and let me just preface that I'm, I'm not talking about sexual consent to a five-year-old. I, I don't think that's appropriate. Um, there's a lot of books around like private parts are private and stranger danger, which are really important kids books to have and conversations to have with kids. But I'm just talking about consent, about like in my book, there's a kid who's sitting on the swing with themselves and having a great time. And then this kid rushes up and pushes them and they go flying and get stuck in a cloud and their day is completely ruined. And they don't know how to get down and they don't know how to say what happened. Um, and so there's ways to contextualize it, but I think adults have a really hard time talking to me about teaching kids about consent or s sexuality education at all because they think it's this mature material that kids can't handle when really I don't think we give kids enough credit and we don't acknowledge the types of violences that they are contending with. Um, so I really hope my book is kind of a, link, a way to give language for us as adults and caregivers to talk about to talk about things like consent that might help contextualize things they might experience as they get older. Um, One of my favorite things that I've ever heard you say as we've been in these conversations was this idea of just touch. Mm -hmm. You know, how it starts with just, you know, can I put my hand on your shoulder as yeah. a kid? You know, can I, can you move over from the swing versus let me, you know, hit you? And then, and then that, you know, can I touch you? Can I put my hand on your shoulder? That goes, that follows you through your entire life. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that goes, I think, this, this idea of space and community keeps coming up in my mind as we're talking because, mm -hmm. you know, that is, you know, if you don't know how to ask if you can touch somebody, then you probably won't know how to um, sort of be in the world in which you are a privileged person, you know, from, yeah. all of these things sort of yeah. fall into one another, mm -hmm. um, that you will be intruding upon, upon other people's spaces in neighborhoods and uh, not being aware of your surroundings. Um, and so it, it's, although the book is about, I like the fact that the book is about consent specifically starting with like the basics of like what consent is yeah. because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And all, all of us are working in different spaces where education happens, not only along your lives and age, but also, you know, maybe lap reading with this book or reading in a kindergarten classroom. Or I also kind of have like fantasized about it being used as this great icebreaker for high school sex ed classes. <laughs> um, and I lost my train of thought as I got caught up I have in my one. future. I think I, I, think I stole your thought. <laughs> um, I think I've been, I recently finished reading Hannah Wren's uh, Orig Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, I took like a class at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. It was a four week crash course. Um, I, if anybody wants to try it, it's really fun. Um, but one of the things, uh, the book is about um, sort of uh, Nazi Germany and about fascism and about how totalitarianism, how that was even possible in the world. And, um, you know, that was an ideology the same way that capitalism is an ideology, the same way that um, uh, racism is an ideology. It's all these mm -hmm. things that are very different but also follow the same trajectory um, and start sort of in the same way. And the book, this. 800 page book <laughs> ends on her basically saying ideology is a faulty system uh, because for as long as new people are born, for as long as we have young minds, uh, those pre existing ideologies can't survive. And I think, um, you know, I'm aware that we have sort of a minute left, and I think this is a good place to end in that um, the kids that you're helping, the kids that you're helping, and the uh, work that we're doing in education, I think, gives possibility for. Uh, better systems and better and new words. We need new words too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can I close with a quote from Richard Shaw? Yes. <laughs> um, so this is from a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. And there's a foreword in the 30th edition, 30th anniversary edition that I love. And I think ties this all together great. It says, there is no such thing as a neutral education process. Education either functions as an instrument that is used to facilitate the integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system and create conformity, or it becomes a practice of freedom, the means by which men and women deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. Well. <laughs> I think
now we have some Q and A time, uh, about 15, 12 minutes. Yeah. Yep. Um, yes. Hi. Um, so, Karina, I actually have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, so, just to like make sure I'm across, okay, so that what you're working on is that you have a site where you can like, sell work and there's like that kind of a thing built up where you can. What is the. Can you explain? Like, yes, I can explain exactly. a little more. So, essentially, the Void Academy, like the best way that I can possibly explain it, it's an educational platform, but it's a research, on, a research project and a collaborative project built by the community um, and in collaboration with the community that it's for. So. Reductively, it's a online courses. Online courses that teach artists how to make a living using alternative business models, specifically advocating for crowdfunding as the business business model um, to to go for. Um, so right now, we're just on the verge of launching the platform in probably around midsummer with our first five um, sort of uh, base um, core curriculum courses that um, our introduction to web presence. Uh, Introduction to community building, introduction to crowdfunding, and step-by-step -step crowdfunding for artists. All this is that clear? Up a yeah, bit? totally. So um, I'm interested in like, how are you like mitigating crowdfunding kind of money? Like, if you're like, how in teaching those courses, like, if that's already inherent within the public, right? That they have this opinion of like art being something that they're just feeding into like this like capitalistic uh, system, then how? Like what? Are, what are you working on to also like distribute that knowledge to public so that in this crowdfunding, there's it's not kind of like just a perpetuation. If that makes any sense, I don't know if I'm making any sense of what I'm asking. It would, make, it would make a little bit more sense if you told me which public you're referring to. Okay, so I guess like right. So I'm I'm interested in like I'm wondering like okay maybe what I guess just like overall like I mean I, I guess I could see like who are you marketing it towards. Who are you marketing the crowdfunding platform towards? Like, who is going to be? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, like, I, I kind like, of, I, I get what you're saying. I'm asking that, but I'm just interested in like the resistance that you like are maybe predicting or wondering if you'll come up against in that regard. So the constituency that we're serving is artists who want alternative ways of funding their work, which is not going through grants, which is not trying to get like museum residencies or um, gallery representation. Yeah. Um, and we're not sort of ostracizing the people that. Do like you can do a hybrid. You can be represented by a gallery, but also you know uh, sell your work directly to your community as well. So, um, so our constituency is young artists or artists of any kind who want to make a living doing solely art. Um, the hegemony that exists within the arts is something that we're very aware of, and that we were also like. That's why I called it a, an ongoing research project as well as an educational platform, and also taking away from um, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed as well as like we're not experts. We are people who are you know constantly researching. Um, the one of the biggest sort of red flags that comes up with me with crowdfunding specifically is that sometimes rewards are structured in such a way that. Um, you know, the $10,000 backer is the one who actually gets the art, and everybody else sort of gets the mm, whatever. Um, but there's ways to sort of push back and work and work out rewards in a way that, you know, doesn't do that. Um, I don't know, an example would be the $10,000 backer gets nothing. You just, you're a philanthropist. Um, you do it because you want to. Um, that's, you know, sort of a way example. But there definitely is a way in which crowdfunding also ties back as everything to um, capitalism. And so I think that um, it can, the best way that I've seen it work is when it's a, an artist who has a small community who, uh, or, or a large community who supports the artist with as little as they can. So a dollar, ten dollars. Um, yeah, I'm going to end there because there's, but it's a great question and it's definitely something that we're aware of and are thinking through on a daily basis. These are such great projects. I'm so happy to see you all defining education so broadly. It's really very inspiring listening to listen to. And I think uh, even though you're all critiquing capitalism, you all have great things to sell. I'm like, I want to buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> Where can I buy it? Um, so my, the thing I know most about is the sex, sex education part. And I really think it's such a critical intervention that you're making. I guess it's more a compliment or comment than a, than a question. but. You know, I say this actually as someone who knows about sex ed, but also as a parent, and that on the one hand, there's this 
silence, right? Like yeah. children are not sexual. Like you should yeah. not like the resistance you're talking about. How can you even bring up these things? You're gonna give them ideas. Yeah. Right? And so I think you skirt that really successfully by saying like this is about being pushed on a swing into the sky, right? Even yeah. though these messages go further. But then on the other hand, it's a really great um, intervention too because. For all that silence, we're also surrounded, children, with deafening messages oh, that yeah. only reiterate these like really damaging sexual uh, forms of sexual violence. I think all the time as a mother of a little girl, how many times I'm told like you're gonna lock, have to lock her up from the boys. You're gonna have to beat them off with a stick. Right. I'm like, is this the medieval? Like, who right. does that? <laughs> Apparently, people in the West right. Village in 2008. Right. Oh, but all of that messaging yeah. is the antith is like what you're trying to disrupt, and yeah. I think it's wonderful. So good job, all of you. Thank you. Keep it up. Yeah, another one that always astounds me is a cute little boy. Oh, he's gonna be a lady killer. Right. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> what, how are we gonna be key to being a murderer? Like, exactly. Yeah, well, thank you. Sure, great work. It seems like a lot of the disrupting of the systems that you're talking about involves the creation of new radical spaces mm -hmm. and those spaces being an interruption. But how would you anticipate those spaces then being in communication with you know, the hegemonic systems that are in existence, or do you think that their direct existence will just kind of cause its own wave or own trickle down? Do you understand what I'm saying there? Or Yes, definitely. This is something you, yeah. you explain it a little bit. I think <laughs> I, mean, you? I think what you're I think what you're trying to get at and tell me if I'm yeah. if I'm wrong is that, you know, radical change is really hard to make happen. It yeah. doesn't you can't just like walk in and be like, I have this yeah. great idea. Oh, you wanna join me? Okay, now we're here, now we're doing it. Yeah. Um, because there's always going to be people on the street that say awful things yeah. to, to children, and yeah. um, there's always going to be pub the public school system that's not just going to adapt Kelsey's book, although that would be wonderful if they just did. Yeah. Um, so how do we continue trying to make radical change while also maintaining contact with the mm. systems? And um, I think for um, it's it's a complicated question. I think for my project is you know I'm not you know I'm not tr running into the museum and, and like overthrowing the museum. I think I'm saying okay you can stay over here, but we're gonna go to New Jersey the summers of New Jersey and we're gonna make art there and it's yeah. gonna be funded by people all over the world because they care about art being inserted into spaces that are insulated yeah. from it. You know. So like so, maybe once the space gets big enough, or then you know it will start to you know, intrude then, or like how does the communication then, you know, are those mm -hmm. spaces going to be, because if they're creating a new language and all of these new things, like are those communities going to stay in kind of their own bubbles, or is it that they'll grow so big that they'll start to, there will be equality, or yeah. like. I think that a lot of things happen. I can't help but think of the dialectic of change in a society where you have a norm and then you have the mm -hmm. anti and then they, yeah. make a new norm and then there's a new anti, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, you're always pushing the discourse forward. You're always creating new spaces because you can't, we can't stop change from happening. Yeah. It's, so yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of active kind of fighting to get in, to be able to be taken seriously and actually get to the table with these <laughs> dominant institutions or spaces like how can I go up against focus on the family which is a huge organization that puts out um, I mean some good stuff but some stuff that they well anyways <laughs> um, or some of these larger sex education huge companies like how what is it going to take for me to actually get at the table with them yeah. um, and challenge what they're doing and I think there's a lot of grassroots organizing, like taking what you have to the places that want it and need it. Um, yeah, I think that's the thing about grassroots organizing in general is that you never know what the, the outcome that you're pushing for is the one right now. Like you just want to help people now. And I think, you know, I got into an argument recently with a professor of mine who uh, was like, well, we need to like get the NEA back. Like we need to make sure the National Endowment for the Arts starts doing their job again. And I was like, Okay, see you in 35 years. Like, let's see if it actually happens. And that's the thing is that people are dying now. People, yeah. you know, there's sexual violence going on yeah. now. There's artists not being able to make a living and families that are starving and families that are being displaced now. So we're going to try and talk about how we can, you know, 
nice talk to government or we're yeah. just going to make, are we going to organize, become a community and help yeah. each other right now? And then hopefully if the movements, the movements grow together and grow big, then yeah, you know, we'll go after the government too. We'll go over the big guys too. But yeah. in the meantime, it's just about being active and in the moment. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of your, uh, the, I just want to know about the role of making in your educational practice, because obviously you could have had just like a lecture series of artists coming in and talking, talking to these kids, but you mentioned resistance and healing, which is beautiful, and I just want to know like what, what, what is it that makes that practice resistant in a society that, that I think discourages especially low income kids of color from making things um, or even criminalizing it in terms of like graffiti or something like that. I just want to know why you chose to go about this you know, process the way that you did. Um, relating it to even the last question, I mean, there is power in your community. Mm -hmm. um, so bringing people together, even going back to my own adolescence and feelings of like depression or loneliness um, and for it to be a way to bring people together and I think that's really beautiful. But also to build in a way that art is work. Um, and these are artists that are giving their time to come in and talking about their own creative process and showing that there are other ways that whatever your art history textbook said that Picasso did or those 15 Picasso paintings that you saw do not relate to you. How is, what is a way that I can create art? Um, and there have been a ton of different ways and a ton of different ways that we've made art. We've made art from found materials around the youth center. Um, created a sculpture, uh, used, shared our resources with the Bushwick School for Music, and we had actually like a drumming lesson, and we played with some synthesizers. Um, there's just like so many different ways to make, and I just want people to know about them. Okay. Well, it looks like our time is up. Unless we have any. I yeah, one final burning. <laughs> Everybody burning up? <laughs> no? All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.